good morning, good afternoon, and for some of you, potentially good evening. My name is Corey Mathis, and I'm the Sales and Support Manager for Keysight's ESOF EDA Design Tools. And I'll be your host for today's virtual seminar on electrothermal simulation using Keysight's Advanced Design System. Joining us today is Jason Bowe. Jason has a master's degree in wireless and microwave engineering from the University of South Florida and has spent the last 14 years as a field applications engineer with Keysight Technologies, working with, a, with customers on a variety of applications, including MIMIC and PCB design. A fun fact about Jason is that he has a deep love of all types of music. And when he's not helping customers spin gallium nitride or FR4, he's been known to spin the occasional record as a DJ. So Jason, with that, the dance floor is all yours. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Corey. Hey, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we've noticed a lot of interest in this topic lately, and that's what prompted this webcast. So today I plan on focusing on the practical as opposed to the theoretical. And so the hope here is that you can actually go forth and use this stuff in your work. And we probably have a mix of folks on the line in terms of experience. And so some are probably experienced with thermal simulations, and some are probably not. But uh, the good news is today's material should be useful uh, regardless of your experience level. But that being said, I am going to assume that you're familiar with ADS in general. So I'll start with some basics about thermal simulation and just kind of lay the groundwork. But then after that, we'll be able to go deeper, and I'll be getting into a good amount of detail. So if I start a little too slow or too basic for you, uh, don't worry, we'll quickly ramp up as we proceed. Today will be mostly slides, and also there will be a couple polls sprinkled in to make it interactive. And then about halfway through, I'll get into some live demos. So at the very least, I encourage you to stick around just to see if it goes smoothly, because uh, as you know, anything can happen during live demos. So that will at least keep it interesting. Uh, and then at the end, uh, we plan on having some Q&A, as Corey mentioned. And so that's it. That's the agenda for today. And so with that, let's jump in. So uh, why do engineers even bother with performing electrothermal simulations, or why should they? Well, at a high level, it's the same reason that we perform any type of simulation, really. We're trying to gain insights into our design. And so that begs the question, what types of insights can you gain by thermal simulations? I would argue that you can group them into two main categories, performance and reliability. And when we look at performance, we can look at all different types of metrics or figures of merit. So you could look at RF-related metrics, like I'm showing here, which is P out versus P in for power amplifier. And by the way, my presentation is very RF-focused, but of course we could look at non-RF-related performance metrics as well. So that's the first category, performance. Uh, the next category is reliability, and that has to do with device lifetimes. And um, uh, I'm showing you here a, a common, uh, commonly used uh, metric, which is mean time to failure. And I'm also showing a commonly cited rule of thumb that a device's lifetime is cut in half for every 10 degrees increase in temperature. And so what you're seeing here in the plot on the right is a direct correlation between temperature and reliability. And you're also seeing two different data points along this mean time to failure trace. And one point was from a simulation that used self-heating models, and the other was from a uh, full 3D finite element method simulation, which includes not only self-heating but all the mutual heating on the chip between the devices. And as you can see, the mutual heating effects can be significant, and so that's why it's important to perform uh, full 3D thermal simulations whenever possible, as opposed to using simpler self-heating models. So just like RF engineers are already worried about electromagnetic coupling, they should also worry about thermal coupling. So if you weren't already worried about thermal coupling, you're welcome. I'm giving you one more thing you can worry about. So why should you perform electrothermal simulations in ADS in particular? Uh, in other words, why should you pick ADS as the tool to do this? Well, a good reason is because ADS has everything you need. It has a full layout environment, which is capable of combining IC layouts and package layouts. And then besides the layout, there are, of course, all the circuit simulators and a full 3D finite element method thermal simulator. 
and very importantly, all the links between the two, the circuit simulation and the thermal simulation, uh, that automate the passing of data between the two domains, the electrical domain and the thermal domain. If you've ever tried to do this manually, which is, you know, pass data between circuit simulators and thermal simulators, you already know it's a tedious process, and you have to manually pass power dissipations from schematic models to the thermal simulator, and then manually pass device temperatures from the thermal solver to schematic models. What makes this even trickier is it's an iterative process. In other words, to do it right, you have to iterate several times because the power dissipations depend on the temperatures, and the temperatures depend on the power dissipations. The good news is ADS handles all these iteration steps automatically, and so now it becomes practical even for fairly large device counts. So later I'll go, in, uh, go into a, a bit more detail about how this iteration process works in ADS, and you also get to see the stuff in action during the demos. So as I mentioned, ADS has an integrated thermal solver, and uh, this thermal solver has a name. It's called Heatwave. Although when it's inside of ADS, we tend to just call it ADS Thermal or ADS Electrothermal. Uh, Heatwave is also integrated with third-party tools like Cadence Virtuoso and HSPICE, and we use the name Heatwave when it's paired with these third-party tools. The focus of my presentation today is on ADS, but I do want to show you one example of a Heatwave simulation in Cadence Virtuoso. So this is an example that I like to show because it illustrates Heatwave's capacity and also its accuracy. So this uh, shows some published results from AMD on an, on an IC that has 800,000 transistors and 4.5 million heat generating elements, which includes devices and interconnects. So AMD was very concerned about the temperatures of the interconnects between devices. I'm showing here a plot of measured versus simulated, and it shows very good correlation to within a degree in most places. And so again, the focus of today is on ADS, and the types of problems that we're trying to solve in ADS are quite different than that previous example from AMD. And um, the focus of ADS is on RF microwave type problems, and specifically it's on RFICs and MIMICs, along with their packages. So the device counts for these ICs are a lot lower than that previous example, but these devices do, of course, come with their own unique sets of challenges. So this design is very representative of the types of circuits that our customers solve using ADS. It's a three-stage power amplifier designed using a wind-gas process, and it's targeted at WLAN applications. There are two versions of this design, and both versions have identical schematics, but the layouts are different. So in one version of the design, the devices are laid out such that the RF transistors are thermally isolated from the bias transistors. And that's the top two plots that you see. And we're applying a pulsed RF input signal. As you can see in the isolated version, the uh, temperature of the bias transistor, T mirror, does not track with the temperature of the RF transistor, TRF. And you can also see some gain hysteresis, which is a manifestation of thermal memory effects. Now look at the bottom two plots, and the version of this design has a layout where the bias transistors and the RF transistors are thermally coupled together. So the temperature T mirror of the bias does track with TRF, and the gain hysteresis is reduced. So this is just one example of um, how, having uh, integrated electrical and thermal simulations can, unco can uncover uh, potential performance issues in ADS. So I wanted to mention this other tool that's inside of ADS today, um, even though it's not the topic of today's presentation. And uh, this is a board level thermal tool that's inside of ADS, and it's part of the signal integrity and power integrity suite of tools inside of ADS called SI Pro and PI Pro. So PI Pro stands for Power Integrity Professional. There is a thermal solver inside of that tool and allows you to do um, very complex board simulations. So it could be very large and multi-layer boards that you can solve. And as you can see here, you can model the package thermal resistances and add heat sinks and thermal pads and things like that and simulate at the board level. 
Um, so this is not the topic of today, but I did want to mention it. The topic of today is on ICs and on packaged IC thermal simulation. So that's really the, the focus of this tool um, today. And uh, we have a much finer spatial resolution on this tool, and you actually need a much finer spatial resolution on this tool in order to resolve the correct device temperatures on an IC. And so what I'm showing here is uh, measurements done by the University of Bristol on a GAN device. And you can see in the red, we've got IR imaging, which has a resolution of about 7 microns. And we're comparing that to Raman thermography, which has a resolution of about 1 micron. And as you can see, we're predicting much higher temperatures when we have much finer resolution. And this is important because, as you remember in uh, the previous slide, the mean time to failure, uh, that rule of thumb of uh, a 10 degree increase in device temperature re reduces the lifetime in, uh, by half. Well, if you're off by 10 degrees when you're predicting the device temperature, that can have a very huge impact on the performance and reliability that you're predicting. So you need very fine spatial resolution. And so I'm going to walk you through two different modes of thermal simulation in ADS. There's what we call full electrothermal co-simulation, which requires both a schematic and a layout. And sometimes I'll refer to this as ETH, short for electrothermal. And then there's another mode called floor planner, and that's a layout only thermal simulation. And I'll walk through how those work, and I'll also demo both of these in uh, today's presentation. So let's walk through a full electrothermal co-simulation step by step. So as I mentioned, you need a schematic and a layout, and you also need thermal tech files, thermal, thermal technology files. And I'll talk about these in greater detail in the coming slides. Um, so what you do is you perform an initial circuit simulation with some initial temperatures. So these initial temperatures could be initial guesses or ambient temperatures, but you need some initial temperature to feed into the initial circuit simulation. And then you solve the electrical equations in your chosen circuit simulator, just like any normal circuit simulation. And then we write power dissipations for each device in your schematic. These power dissipations get passed into the thermal simulator. And the thermal simulator solves thermal equations, and it writes temperatures. These temperatures get passed back into the circuit simulation. And we perform another circuit simulation using the updated temperatures. And we again solve electrical equations, and we again write out new power dissipations. And those power dissipations again get passed into the thermal simulator. And so this process repeats. And uh, it repeats until we get self-consistent powers and temperatures within some delta P and delta T values. That is. Uh, that are user settable. And so you get two benefits out of performing full electrothermal co-simulation. You get more accurate circuit simulations because you'll have more accurate device temperatures for all the devices in the schematic. But of course, that assumes that your device models are accurate versus temperature. But as long as that's the case, you will get more accurate performance um, prediction. And then you also get the benefit of using uh, the full 3D thermal viewer that's embedded in ADS. So you can probe and post-process the temperature and view the temperature in full 3D. So those are the two benefits of performing this. So when you're doing electrothermal co-simulation, uh, you can see all of these simulators are supported. So DC, AC, and S parameters all assume no time dependence. In fact, the AC and S parameter simulation thermal sim solutions are based on the DC thermal solution. Harmonic balance is fully supported. And it's valid as long as all of the tones in the harmonic balance simulation are higher than the thermal time constants of your device. And usually that's the case, except in the um, instances where you have a small delta F two-tone simulation or if you have mixing products that are very low frequency. 
And if that's the case, if you have low frequency content, then you may want to consider running circuit envelope or transient simulations. And so both of those simulators are supported. And both of those simulators, as you probably know, have time steps associated with them. And you can set the electrical time step separately from the thermal time step. So each can have their own time step. And typically, the electrical time steps will be much finer and much smaller time step to resolve the electrical signals than what you'll typically need for a thermal time step. We also support a logarithmic thermal time step, and that allows you to simulate over longer time scales more efficiently. We have a very, um, very uh, useful, pardon the pun, um, feature called thermal reuse. And that can really speed up some electrothermal co-simulations. And um, it's a two-step process, which uh, you initially need to extract an ETH data model, and then you can reuse that model. The model will be placed in a .rm file in your data directory of your workspace. And it does take some time to extract the model, but once you have the extracted model, the subsequent simulations will be much, much faster. And so uh, I'll demo uh, the reuse process uh, in the coming uh, electrothermal demo, so you'll see um, more details about that. We do have another way of reusing data, which is a non-iterating simulation that just loads device temperatures from a previous simulation. That's a much simpler approach, um, but that is available if you'd like to use that as well. Now, if you're using this thermal reuse uh, procedure, you need to keep in mind that nothing should change about the layout. So boundary conditions should not change, the layout should not change, and things like ambient temperature and things like that should not change. And ADS does not check for changes, so it's up to the user to make sure that if you're reusing electrothermal data that you're using it under the right conditions. And so here are some limitations for this thermal reuse feature. Uh, it does not work with transient or envelope simulations. So anything with a time step uh, does not work with. The thermal viewer, the 3D thermal viewer that allows you to look at and plot all the temperatures in full 3D, that is not available if you're reusing thermal data. You cannot, as I mentioned, change the ambient temperature or the boundary conditions or the layout in any way. So now let's talk about this other mode that I mentioned earlier, which is the thermal floor planner mode. So in this mode, we go ahead and take away all that schematic related stuff, and we're just running layout only thermal simulations. And this is called the thermal floor planner. So the name floor planner might imply that you should only use it in the planning stages of a design. But actually, you can use it later on in the design process on full layouts if you'd like. The, the only caveat is you have to manually enter in all the power dissipations in the layout, and so that could become tedious on a, on a full, complicated design. But there's nothing stopping you from running a thermal floor planner simulation on all of the mask layers and all of your heat sources in a full design. And as I mentioned, no schematic or circuit simulations required. And as part of the floor planner, we have a wizard that facilitates the addition of arrays of heat sources. So if you don't know what heat sources are, don't worry. I'm going to go into detail about heat sources uh, in the coming slides. But uh, these are regions of the layout that dissipate power as heat, and we can place arrays of them all at once, which really makes it easier for multi-finger devices like transistors and other types of devices. And, um, and I'll demo this, this uh, heat array placement later. All right, so as promised, I'm going to walk you through some details about heat sources. And sometimes I use the term power sources, and I use these terms interchangeably, and they mean the same thing. So heat sources in ADS layout are 3D regions of the layout that dissipate power as heat. So they can represent various devices like transistors, resistors, even transmission lines or vias, or you can even 
use them to represent a larger kind of design block in in a design where maybe you don't have that smaller part of the system designed yet and you just want to represent some power dissipation and see the thermal performance as it relates to some other part of the system. So you could even do that. What's important to know about the uh, heat sources is they're not two-dimensional, they're three-dimensional, so they have a z-dimension thickness, and that's determined by the slice in the substrate definition. And we'll talk about the substrate definitions in detail in the coming slides. Heat sources are always rectangular, and so if you need to um, draw or represent any other shape, then what you'll have to do is represent that shape as multiple rectangles. And we do have uh, customers doing that, so that does work. And heat sources are always drawn on special layers defined in the technology that are called heat layers. And they have a special design or process role called a heat source role. And we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about that definition later. So where should the heat sources be placed? Well, it depends on what type of device we're talking about. And by the way, um, if you have a thermally enabled PDK from a foundry uh, that's thermally enabled for ADS, they have probably or they definitely already placed these heat sources in the P cells of the devices for you. But still, this is good background information for cases where you have to do this yourself or just for general understanding. But if you have a uh, bipolar transistor, um, you, the basic approximation is to put it in the base layer directly under the emitter stripe or stripes. And so what I'm showing here is a single heat source drawn in red, and you can see it's a rectangle. And you can also see a bit of text, Q1, and that bit of text overlaps the heat source. And the bit of text matches the name of the device in the schematic, Q1. And that's the magic that allows uh, the co-simulation and the, the automatic passing of uh, data back and forth between the electrical and thermal domains is the, the matching of the, the names here. And so if you have a FET, um, I'm showing here a, uh, a FET with a, a single gate stripe, and the basic approximation is to put the uh, heat source in the channel layer directly under the gate stripe. And again, you can see there's a bit of text M1, and that matches the name in the schematic. And if you have a resistor, for example, here's a nichrome resistor, you would put the uh, heat source uh, on the nichrome resistive layer right between the end contacts of the resistor. And so these are the only examples I'm showing here, but uh, you could also place heat sources for things like transmission lines and for inductors and other devices and diodes and things like that. So, so when we're calculating temperatures using this full 3D finite element method simulation, we have a full 3D temperature profile of the chip and possibly the package. So how do we pick a single temperature to pass back to, the, uh, to this circuit simulator, right, for each device? So we have different rules to pick these, this single temperature that gets passed back for each device. By default, what ADS does is it averages the temperature for a heat source, and it takes that average temperature and passes it back to the device. And then in the case if you have multiple heat sources for one device, the default behavior is we average all of the heat sources together. So we first average the volume inside of each heat source, and then we average all the heat sources, and then we pass that average temperature back to the multi-finger transistor, for example, right? And so that's the default behavior, but there are controls that allow you to change that behavior. One of the controls that we have is you can use the center instead of the average temperature in each heat source. And so typically the center temperature will be hotter than the average. And so you can uh, choose to use the center instead. Also, we have a control that allows you to change the behavior of what happens when you have multi-finger devices. And so that, as I mentioned, the, the default is average them, but you can also pick the maximum or the minimum. And so the worst case scenario for a multi-finger device, you know, assuming that worst case is hottest, would be you pick 
the center instead of the average for each finger, and then you pick the maximum of all the fingers, and that would be the worst case for each transistor, right? All right, so we are at the point. We're making, I think, pretty good time here, actually. We're, we're ahead of where I thought we would be, and we're going to kick off some live demos. All right, so, um, so now let's go ahead and jump into the live demo, and uh, what I'm going to do is uh, demo using our demo kit, which ships with ADS, and this is a PDK that is representing a fictitious gas process. And so you can see there's gas substrates here and silicon nitride substrates. And uh, there are various conductor layers mapped and via layers mapped. And there's these heat layers that are mapped. And they kind of mirror the conductor layers. So you can see there's a conductor called M2 and then a heat layer called heat M2. And the heat layers have a special process role that you can see over here called heat source. And that's uh, to contrast that, if you go and look at one of these regular conductor layers, they've got a conductor process role, and they have a material assigned to them, in this case gold. If you look at the heat sources, the heat layers, they have no material assigned to them. Instead of having a material assigned to them, they will have a power dissipation assigned to them. And so if you're familiar with this graphical substrate editor already uh, from, from using EM simulations, you know, this should look familiar if, you're, if you've used it, right, and caveats later. One additional step that you have to do if you want to use this, this substrate editor to set up the substrate for thermal simulations is you need to go to File, Export, Thermal Tech Files, and then you will export three thermal tech files, uh, and then those are actually the things that are used by the thermal simulator. So the thermal simulator, unlike our EM simulators, it does not directly use this substrate. It, it uses thermal tech files, and there's various reasons for that, and I'll kind of touch on those a little bit as we go through this demo. So anyways, th this is what the substrate looks like for this design that I'll be demoing. And I'm actually going to demo in reverse order of uh, how I talked about the, the floor planner and the electrothermal. I'm going to start with the floor planner. And so I'll start with a almost blank layout in ADS. And the only things that are here are these little dummy pieces of metal that I drew off in the corners and then this outline. The outline is actually not doing anything. I just drew it there as a visual cue so you can see what the boundaries, where the boundaries will be located as I'm running these floor planner simulations. This is actually not doing anything. What's actually setting the boundary are these little dummy pieces of metal out here. And um, so the floor planner uh, or any thermal simulations, it will always place the side boundaries at the outermost extents of whatever is drawn in your layout. And so that's, this is kind of just setting the outermost extents. And so what I'll do is I'll go to Tools, Thermal Floor Planner, floor plan setup. And uh, this is uh, the window where I can set up and run all of my floor planner simulations. And so the first thing you'll need to do is go and point to a thermal tech file. And in my case, I'm using the demo kit, and it's using tech.tcl. And uh, so you always browse to that tech file. And um, I'll talk about what's in that tech file more later. And then you can set the boundary conditions for the top and the bottom face of this simulation. And so we can set the thermal resistances in terms of Kelvin per watts. And if you need more control over the boundary conditions, you can use an explicit package.ini file instead. So for instance, if you wanted to set the boundary conditions on the side boundaries instead of just the top and the bottom, you would use this package.ini file instead of just this simpler uh, user interface. If you just set the top and the bottom boundaries, what happens is the side boundaries are assumed to be adiabatic, which means no heat will flow in or out of that, um, uh, out of those sides. I'll go ahead and leave the ambient temperature at the default, which it defaults to 25 degrees C. 
And I'll go ahead and leave all the meshing controls as default. I'll talk about meshing in more detail later. So I'll go ahead and add a heat source. And this is the heat source array wizard that I mentioned earlier in the slides. And so this gives me the opportunity to place an array. So I'll go ahead and add, or I'll, I'll modify the array name. I'll just call it array one. And I'll say that this represents a device called Q1. And you can see I can determine or set the, the total power dissipated in this device in terms of power in watts or current and voltage. So I'll just go ahead and set it in terms of power in watts. And I'll set it to be 0.6 watts because I'll have six array elements and I'll split that as 0.1 watts to each of the elements. And it gives me an op opportunity to place um, these array elements on a particular heat layer. So all of those heat layers that I showed you in the substrate appear in this drop-down box. And so I'll put this on the heat mesa layer, which is uh, where the power is dissipated for these transistors. And I'll go ahead and just leave the heat array dimensions as the defaults. So what this will do will be create uh, a two by three, two rows, three column array. And you can see the widths and the pitches in the X and Y directions. So I'll just leave all that stuff as default and just place the array. And so here's my heat array. And if I zoom in, you can see a bit of text has been automatically placed on these rectangles and the text shows you the device name, and it also shows you the amount of power in watts on that array element. So you, you can see it's 0.1 watts on each of these elements. And so I can go ahead and solve uh, this problem now. So this, this will solve um, what I have here, which is very simple. There's no other uh, metallization or mask layers. It's just these, you know, these powers being dissipated on the substrate. Right? So there's no other mass layers drawn at this point. So I'll go ahead and solve this. And automatically, the 3D thermal viewer pops up. You can see a little bit of meshing artifacts here. And I'll talk about meshing controls where you can smooth out the, the thermal plots. Um, but don't worry about that for now. You can see the, on the left side, there's a total temperature range that's displayed from the lowest to the highest on the chip. And um, you can see on the right side, there is a slider that allows me to go through different Z slices of this chip. And as I move through the different slices, you can see the, uh, the temperature, shaded temperature plot changes as I go through different slices, right? So as I Go to the MESA layer, that's the hottest Z slice because that's where the power is being dissipated. And as I get away from the MESA layer in any direction, if I go down or up, it starts to get cooler as I go away from that MESA slice, right? And you can actually look at this from different vantage points. So right now we're looking at it from the top view. I can change and go into orbit mode. So now my mouse is in orbit mode. And I can orbit this around and look at different vantage points if I'd like. And now if I move this slider, it becomes even more apparent as to what we're doing. I can also use my mouse scroll wheel to scroll up and down through the slices of the chip. And I can also enable these various cut planes to look at various locations inside of the chip. So these are all very useful tools that are built in. Um, there's different mouse modes. So as I showed you, there's an orbit mouse mode. There's also a temperature, uh, what we call mouse quantity value. So it's a temperature readout mode. So if I click around in this mode with my mouse, on the bottom, it gives you a temperature readout of that Z slice, right? So that's another very useful mode. So I can click around at any temperature I'd like, and it gives me the temperature readout at that uh, location. Another useful mouse mode is this one here, which is mouse instance properties. And if I go into this mode, I select various array elements. And this gives me a lot of useful information about whatever array element that I've selected down here in the bottom left. And so you can see the array element's name, its average temperature, its total power dissipation, its power density, its total area, and what layer it's drawn on. 
So there's a lot of useful information here that you can get uh, right away. So this is a very simple example. Let me go ahead and add uh, a few more things to, uh, to the layout. So I'll go ahead and add another heat source. And this time I'll do a resistor, and I'll call it R1. And I'll do it just to show you how it works. I'll do the current and voltage this time. And I'll do uh, 0.1 amps. And I'll put it on the heat nichrome layer this time. And this time it's not an array. It's a one by one heat source. And I'll go ahead and just change the width to, let's say, 20 microns. And I'll change the length to 10 microns. And I'll go ahead and place that over here. And so now I've got another heat source. And you can see it's dissipating 0.2 watts. And let me go ahead and just add a couple other things just to show you how it works. Uh, I can add any types of mask layers or, you know, including metallization layers. So let's just go ahead and draw a, just a random piece of metal on um, one of these layers. So I'll draw on the M0 layer. I'll draw a rectangle of metal over here. And I will add something from the demo PDK palette. I'll add a backside via element from that. So this includes geometries and masks from many different layers, all part of this PDK element. And so I'll go ahead and solve this now and show you the results. So if I go to Thermal Floor Planner, I can go ahead and just solve for temperature, or I could even solve for temperature and background. And the difference between those two modes is in background mode, it does not lock up ADS, whereas in this mode it does lock up ADS. Um, so if you solve it in background mode, you can continue working in ADS. So if you have a longer simulation, that could be convenient. The other difference between these two modes, and I'll go ahead and launch that background mode, the other difference between these two modes is the thermal viewer does not pop up automatically uh, like it does for the other mode. So once this is done, I have to go and open up the thermal viewer manually. So I'll show you how to do that. So the thermal simulation is complete. I can go ahead to Window, Open Thermal Viewer. And you can see there's a couple GDA files. These are the thermal viewer files. Um, the one that you typically want is the one that matches the name of the cell. These other ones are intermediate results. So I'll go ahead and pick this one and open up the thermal viewer. And here are the results. So there's a few interesting things we can see in, in this result. So the first is it looks like the nichrome layer this time is the hottest instead of the um, mesa layer. So it looks like the nichrome slice is, is the hottest. You can also notice that that metal that I placed over this location has caused these fingers of the transistor to be cooler because the metal is a better thermal conductor, so it spreads the heat better than the substrate materials. And so that's why these fingers are cooler. And uh, here's a tool that you can use in this thermal viewer. You can actually show all mask geometries. And so if I select all, you can see the mask geometry. So now you can see that piece of metal that I drew here. And you can also see the via that I placed over here. There's a, a couple other ways to look at this data. So you can actually look at um, the layers mask geometry. So uh, if you do that, instead of showing all the mass, uh, layer mass, it'll show just the ones that are in whatever slice that I'm in. So if I go ahead and start moving, so if I start moving this slider, we should see the mask, which it will only see the mask layers in that particular Z slice, right? So that's a different way of looking at it. Um, so remember I placed that via over here, and it's, it's, it's a bit hard to see the, the effects of the via. So if I go down to here, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and turn off these materials or these uh, layer masks. So it's a bit hard to see the effects of the via if I look here. I'll show you one trick that comes in handy is 
uh, instead of showing the total range, the temperature range of the entire chip, you can actually change the display so that you are showing the um, range in a particular Z slice. So this range slice can be useful. And now, if I go down to where the via is, it will be more pronounced. You can actually see the effects of the via, whereas before, the effects of the VIA were a little bit hidden in the noise because we were looking at the overall uh, temperature scale. And, and so the temperature scale has changed based upon the max and min in this slice. So that can be very useful. Another useful uh, tool is that I use pretty frequently, actually, is the ability to look at various um, materials in each slice. So you can actually do that as well. So as I move through this Z slice, it shows me what materials are present in that slice. And so um, it shows you what is the background default material. And so in this slice, the background material is silicon nitride. And then it shows me that there's gold drawn here. This, this tool here has helped me debug several problems several times where, you know, for instance, I, I thought there was air inside of my via, but in fact it was filled with metal, and I was getting results that I didn't understand. Uh, this kind of, you know, view of looking at the materials in each slice of your problem can actually be very, very useful, and you can discover a lot of uh, interesting uh, things that way. And so just to, to kind of finish off the demo of this thermal viewer, I, I can show you we have, in addition to this shaded view, um, we have some other... Um, types of plots. We have contour curves. We have ISO surfaces. Here, so here's ISO surfaces. And we have um, also uh, surface plots as well. So we have a few different ways to look at uh, these temperature results. All righty. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and show you the next demo, which is the electrothermal. So that kind of wraps up the floor planner demo. So hopefully that gives you a good feeling for what you can do. And uh, so now I'll talk about the electrothermal simulations. And I'll start with a harmonic balance simulation. So I won't run this live because it takes about seven minutes to complete. But I will be running some simulations live here in a moment. So this simulation is on a full Mimic PA. And let's just go ahead and take a look at this Mimic PA real quick. I'll, do, I'll push down into it. You can see that the PA is built hierarchically. In both the schematic and the layout, it's built hierarchically. And we have input matching network, output matching network, interstage matching network, and a couple FET networks. And um, you know, I could even push down further here and show you the FET networks, right? So this is all built completely hierarchically. And um, I can go ahead and look at the, this is the schematic view, and I can go ahead and look at the layout view of this PA. And so here's the layout view. And if I look at the layers here, I'll go ahead and turn off the visibility for all the layers except for the heat layers. So I'll go ahead and just, you know, Turn off, um, turn off everything except for heat M0. So you can see on the heat M0 layer, there's some rectangles drawn, and these are for various transmission lines. We've got heat M1 layer, and this is also for transmission lines, and heat M2 transmission lines. And then we've got the heat MESA layer for the transistors, and then we have the heat nichrome la layer for a resistor. Right, so we've got all these different heat layers that are drawn as part of, as part of the PDK elements. And so the, the co-simulation will automatically happen because the, uh, the PDK has been set up to automatically pass data between all of these heat sources and their um, corresponding schematic models in the schematic. So this is the design uh, that we're simulating. And... Uh, We'll go ahead and uh, close this layout window, and I'll pop back up. And so you can see we're running a power-swept harmonic balance simulation. We're sweeping P in. So this is a P1 tone that we're putting into the power amplifier, and we're sweeping the P in from minus 10 to 4 dBm. 
And you can see we've placed an electrothermal simulation controller in the schematic, and I'll go ahead and double-click on that. You can see you can uh, set the reuse behavior. We'll talk about reuse in a moment. You have to always point to a thermal tech file, just like you do in the floor planner. And uh, you can set the boundary conditions, similarly to how I showed you in the floor planner. Or you could use a package.ini file. And then there's some advanced settings here, too, that I kind of hinted at earlier, where you can use the center instead of the average temperatures for the fingers. You can, you know, instead of using the average of fingers, you can take the maximum. So that's where these controls are located in the, in the advanced tab. And so you can also see we placed an options controller, and that sets the ambient temperature for the simulation. So I'm not going to run this simulation because it takes about seven minutes. But what I will do is show you how you can extract a reusable ETH data model for this. So I'm not going to run this extraction routine because it takes even longer. It takes about 25 minutes to extract data for this amplifier. But I want to show you how it works. So you can see here we're not sweeping power. We're picking some PN that's somewhere in the middle of the ultimate power sweep that we want to ultimately perform. And we want to, and we want to um, uh, extract a reusable data model, right? So if we go through uh, the electrothermal controller, you can see we're extracting an ETH da data um, model for reuse, and that'll create that .rm file. And so, I, as I said, I'm not going to show this live, but what I, w what I will show live is the reuse. So now, assuming we already ran the 25-minute you know, extraction routine, I can go into the electrothermal controller and say, I just want to reuse that data. And now, if I run the power swept, so remember, I only extracted at one power value, but now I'm sweeping when I reuse it. And I can, I can run this simulation live because it's very fast. And so you can see a very good correlation between the um, reused data, which is the blue, and the brute force method, which is the brute force you know, simulating electrothermal at every different power level. And so um, and you can see we extracted the data at only one point, but nevertheless, the trends are followed throughout the entire power sweep. So this is really good correlation. You can see well within a degree. And the worst, you know, the most deviation we're seeing is two degrees over here on this um, device. So a uh, very good correlation. And the correlation even holds up if we switch the, the bias point. So here's a different bias point. So uh, previously we extracted the model using a 5-volt bias, but now we're using a 3-volt bias. And if I run this simulation that reuses the data, you can see even though we've gone away uh, quite a bit from the, the temperatures at which we extracted this model, we're still getting good correlation between the brute force method, which is the black, and the um, reuse, which is the red. And so we extracted way up here at the blue, but we're still getting the trends in the reuse model. So this is really good results. So that's harmonic balance. Um, uh, I got to kind of speed up because now we're kind of getting uh, a little bit long on the demo part. So real quick, uh, I'll show you a transient movie just to show you what that looks like. Um, so I'm not going to run this simulation, but I, I can show you the pre-generated transient movie. So we've run a transient simulation. And as I mentioned before, the electrothermal time step has its own time step, which is, in this case, we set it to be one microsecond. And here's the uh, thermal results. And we can go to Display Transient Movie. And it'll go ahead and play the movie from start to finish. And then I could also optionally, you know, manually move this transient movie slider around if I'd like to see the transient results at any point. So let me go ahead and uh, wrap up the demos now. So hopefully that gives you a flavor for how this works. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And we'll return to the slides, and we'll keep it moving. All right, so let's talk about thermal technology files. Uh, as I mentioned, there's three thermal technology 
files that must exist for as a prerequisite for any thermal simulation. There's a tech.tcl, there's a heatlayers.config, and there's a streamlayertable.txt. And all of these three files will be already pre-populated in any thermally enabled PDK that you get from a foundry. And so they'll typically be located in a thermal folder somewhere in the PDK directory. And uh, it's very common as a user of a PDK that you'll want to add layers above and or below the IC to model the package or some other thing around the IC. And so you have a couple options to do this. You can either manually edit these tech files, or you can use the graphical substrate editor, which creates this .subst file. However, there's a caveat with using the graphical substrate editor in that it does not support all of the capabilities of the thermal tech files. And sometimes you will need to manually edit these thermal tech files. So here's the graphical substrate editor um, that I showed you before. And as I mentioned, you can manually uh, set this up in the graphical substrate editor uh, graphically and then export the thermal tech files. And you can also set up all the material properties in the same place where you set up material properties for electro uh, or electromagnetic simulations. So if you never notice this, the thermal properties are right next to the electromagnetic properties. I already demoed this, so I'll just go ahead and skip this. Uh, you've already seen the conductor role and the heat process role. So if you look in the, the tech.tcl file, you'll see some, um, uh, typically you'll see the thermal conductivity K is defined as temperature K pairs. So this is temperature in degrees paired with um, what is the uh, you know, uh, thermal conductivity at that temperature. So that's one way to define thermal um, or temperature dependent thermal conductivity, which by the way our, our tool supports and that's a very important thing to model, right? And so you can model it using these pairs, or you can even use an equation in the thermal tech file. Another material property is volumetric heat capacity, and this comes into play when you're running time-varying simulations, and this is a uh, material property that uh, can be calculated by taking the material's specific heat and multiplying times the uh, density. So if you look in a thermal tech file, in addition to the material properties, you'll see all the Z slices laid out this way. And, and actually, they're laid out upside down. So it starts from the bottom of the chip and goes to the top. And it shows the thickness of each slice, followed by the background material, followed by any layers and their materials. And the layers in that slice are listed in order of precedence with the uh, most precedence coming first. So whatever material has the most precedence, that comes first, or whatever layer. In the thermal viewer, the Z slider that I was demoing earlier directly correlates with the Z slices that are in the tech file, in the thermal tech file, except that the, in the thermal tech file, they're upside down. And then just to kind of round out the, the discussion, so these are the other two thermal tech files. So I, I showed you the tech.tcl. These are the other two I mentioned, the heat, heat layers config and the stream layer table dot text. Uh, the heat layers config has all the heat layers listed and the stream layer table has all the other layers listed that are not heat layers. All right, so let's talk a little bit about boundary conditions. So whenever we're running these full 3D thermal simulations, it's a finite element method simulation. And so the problem was always placed inside of a box. And the sides of the box, the six faces, um, are the boundaries. And we need to set boundary conditions for these six faces. So there are two modes in which we can set these boundary conditions. The simple mode is the one that's available in the graphical user interface, and that allows you to only set the top and the bottom face. And the, the other six or the other four sides are all assumed to be adiabatic. And so we allow you to do that just as a simple way to set it up. And if you need more control, you can set this package.ini file, and that allows you full control over every aspect of all six faces of the boundaries. And here's just an example of what a package.ini file looks like. There's various parameters, K ambient, L ambient, T ambient, and C ambient. And you can set the, the um, every direction of, of X, Y, and Z, the plus and minus directions. 
Um, so uh, this is what the file looks like. So I'm just showing here an example package where the package material has a conductivity of 0.125, and, it, and there's two millimeters of that packaging material around the chip. And then in the Z minus direction, we've got a piece of metal with much higher thermal conductivity. It's 250 watts per meters Kelvin. And, and then also just to show you what it looks like, we set just arbitrarily a lower ambient temperature in the minus Z direction just to show you you can do it. And so this is just an example to show you what uh, the package shot INI file looks like. It's very simple to set up and it gives you full control. Um, you can also do some things with bond wires in the package.ini file, like model um, the heat um, flux or the heat escaping or being conducted through bond wires through bond pads. And so you can do that through things called bond statements in the package.ini file. There's other ways to model bond wires that I'll touch on later. So as I mentioned, you need to be careful uh, about where you're placing the borders or the, the boundaries of the problem. and the boundaries, the sides, are automatically put in the outermost extents of your drawing. So just keep that in mind. So you can either draw a polygon around your design, or you can put some corner polygons to define the extents. And you, you want to make sure you set the boundary, uh, the boundary locations in a good place. And, and one good recommendation is to try to set them in the middle of a homogeneous material instead of on the boundary of two materials, uh, especially if one of those materials is a good thermal conductor and one is a poor one. So, um, uh, so that's just a good um, um, practice to try to keep. So there's various physical phenomena that allow for heat transfer, and um, our thermal solver only models conduction. So it does not directly model convection or radiation. But uh, you can actually set boundary conditions to approximate convection. And so one way to do this is by using the heat transfer coefficient, which is K ambient, the, the ambient conductivity divided by the L ambient, which is the length of the thermal resistor in meters. You can use a heat transfer coefficient and then calculate the, the thermal resistance and, plot and, and plug that into the boundary conditions. And so here's some example, uh, examples for for the heat transfer coefficient for still air, unforced convective air, and for uh, forced air. And so you can take that H value, multiply times the area of the face of the chip. So if it's on the top face, you would just take the, the area of the top face of your chip, you would multiply that times H, and then you would take the inverse of that, and you would get the, um, the thermal resistance in, in um, Kelvin per watt. Another trick that I've seen some people use is they take advantage of these adiabatic boundaries that are on the sides, and you can actually use them as symmetry planes. If you've ever done this with electromagnetic simulations, it's very similar. So electromagnetic finite element method solvers also have E and H boundaries that you can take advantage of that kind of split the domain, and it simulates in uh, a little bit faster if you do it this way. So just be aware, you can do this with the adiabatic boundaries too. So let's talk about meshing very briefly. And um, so what the, the key to meshing is you want to you want to do it right, but you don't want to overdo it. And so uh, I see a lot of beginners overdo meshing quite frequently, and so we want to make sure you're not overdoing it. So there's just several uh, mesh um, parameters that you can enter into the user interface. And um, uh, one of them is initial grid seating, and uh, it sets a coarse mesh. Um, and here's how to calculate it. I'm not going to go through these calculations in the interest of time, but you have these slides. The, the nice thing about this initial grid seeding is you can directly calculate it by looking at the, um, the X and Y dimensions of your chip and then choosing a value that gives you uh, five, uh, 50 to 100 micron spacing for mesh points. The mesh refinement setting. This is a setting that I see sometimes get abused by customers. And the default is 4, and the recommended values range from 4 to 8. You don't want to just arbitrarily start cranking this up thinking that you're going to get more accurate results. That's one of the mistakes that I see um, some folks make. And um, it, it, cranking this up does increase simulation time, and beyond a certain point, it won't really increase the accuracy. 
And remember I mentioned earlier about meshing artifacts and sometimes not seeing smooth results? There's various things you can do to smooth those out, uh, including uh, mesh refinements, but, but then also another setting that I'm going to talk about later, which is um, meshing algorithm. But don't overdo this, because remember, we're averaging temperatures together um, a lot of times. And so um, just keep that in mind that if you're doing electrothermal simulations, we're already averaging temperatures inside of um, heat sources, and we're also potentially averaging multiple heat sources together. So don't overdo the meshing. Uh, mesh spatial resolution is, is, is a fairly uh, advanced um, setting, so you probably shouldn't be messing with this setting unless someone from Keysight is telling you to do it. And then the final setting, I say the best for last, is meshing algorithm. I really like this setting for controlling the meshing, and it actually controls several internals of the heat wave uh, solver, and it, it really is a great balance between accuracy and speed. And so we have three settings for this. We have zero, one, and two. Zero kind of is the default, and it kind of favors, I would say, speed over accuracy, but it's still very reasonable. And then we've got one, which gives you some higher mesh um, resolution around the, the edges of heat sources. And then the newest one is two, which I've found very useful for GAN devices with very, very extreme aspect ratios like very, you know, hundreds of microns long gates with, you know, just a fraction of a micron wide. So our final topic is packaging. We're almost done, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. Um, so packaging is um, very cru uh, crucial to, to model with many ICs because the package really directly impacts the, the thermal performance of the chips in many instances. And there's two ways to do it. You can draw or import the package drawing directly into ADS and then mesh and solve it along with the IC. Or you can try to model the package as, a, uh, you know, as boundary conditions on the IC. So you could use the package.ini file to, to model them as boundaries. Or you can use some combination of those two approaches. We do have a, um, a little utility that ships with ADS that only runs in Linux, but it helps you calculate the package.ini parameters to, to fill in for all those different parameters like k-ambient and l-ambient. One thing that uh, you need to keep in mind is in ADS layout, all of the drawings um, are planarized, so there's no truly conformal layers, and this includes bond wires. So we have special bond wire components for electromagnetic simulations, but you cannot use those with the thermal simulations. So if you're going to do bond wire simulations, you need to approximate them like I'm showing here, which is completely vertical and completely horizontal, basically. And a little bit more on bond wire simulations, um, them to generate their own heat and not just conduct heat away from the, ch from the chip, but if you want them to generate heat, well, they must dissipate power. So in order for them to dissipate power, they would need to have heat layers, and they need, those heat layers need to be assigned power dissipations. And, uh, and you can do this. So we do have examples of, of doing this. So if you want to get into that, just let us know. And then finally, um, if you're doing a combination of ICs and packaging and, uh, and, and you need to define the substrate in the graphical substrate editor, uh, there's a couple different approaches. You can try to uh, create one master substrate that includes all the layers, or you can use nested technology, which uh, is supported for the electrothermal simulator, but it's unfortunately at this point it's not supported for the floor planner. So if you need to do it, for the floor planner, you'll need to do the master uh, substrate. And so that is it. So uh, looks like we've got about 15 minutes left. So um, that was all I had. Yeah, so why don't we at this point uh, open up for uh, some Q&A. We've had, Jason, a number of questions roll in throughout the presentations. Clearly, this is a hot topic. So the first question comes from Steve. And he asks, do you have any benchmarks that compare measured versus simulated data? We do. We do, actually. Um, if you go into the resources in the console, uh, there's a couple places where you can see some benchmarks. And one of them um, that's it's kind of easy and quick to look up is, um, I forget the name of it, but there's a YouTube video that was done. And there's actually uh, several benchmarks in the YouTube video. 
So go check out our YouTube videos that we have in the, in the resources, and one of them has some benchmark data. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Dheeraj asks, uh, typically how much longer does ETH simulations take when compared to thermal only? That's a good question. So um, because we have to iterate, um, you're, you're running several circuit simulations and several, you know, several circuit and several thermal, right? So it multiplies, right? So it really depends on how long each one of those individual simulations is taking and how, how many iterations you have to perform. We have different controls over how many iterations are performed, so you can kind of have a little bit of control over that and mitigate that if it gets kind of out of control in terms of uh, you know time. Um, but uh, but yeah, really, it, it's one of those answers where it depends, right? And some sometimes the the addition of thermal on top of electrical simulations really is not that much of a time increase, and sometimes it is. Great, thank you, Jason. Uh, Karen asks, um, can I use ADS thermal if my PDK isn't thermally enabled? That is a great question. So um, the, the short answer is yes, you, you can run thermal simulations if your PDK is not enabled from your foundry. Um, but it does, it does make it a lot easier if, you're, if your foundry has enabled the PDK to be um, you know, thermally aware. Right, so we've added some additional capabilities recently in ADS that um, allow you to, instead of put the heat sources down inside of the P cells, you can put the heat sources at the top level of your layout. And that additional capability that we recently added within the last year or so, I think it was, it really made it easier to do this stuff where maybe your PDK is not thermally enabled. However, you're still going to need to get, you know, the thermal material properties from your from your foundry somehow. And so 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 definitely, you know, it, you know, uh, in that scenario where you don't have an enabled PDK, I would I would urge you to to definitely um, ask your ask your um, your foundry to to support it, too. But but there's definitely things you can do. We have a question from Dong. He asks, uh, can you enter temperature dependent material properties for thermal simulation? Yes, you can. So the um, thermal tech file um, allows you to have um, temperature dependent materials and um, you can enter it in uh, in the thermal tech file or you can also enter it in the materials database section of ADS. Uh, if you're familiar with where you enter in all the material database information, not just for thermal, but for electromagnetic you know, electrical properties. In that same place, you can actually enter in temperature-dependent uh, thermal conductivities. So you can do it either in the file or in the user interface. All right. A um, number of questions from Bikas here. Uh, I'm going to choose this one. Um, does ETH work with nested technology or smart mount? Those are good questions. So unfortunately, not at the moment with smart mount, but we're looking into smart mount. So for those of you that don't know, smart mount is our newer way of um, having multiple technologies. So you can have a, an IC technology and a package technology and even other technologies, and, and you can combine these very easily. Um, we don't support that yet for thermal, um, but we're, we're definitely looking into that um, for the for the other method of doing it, which is just the nested technology way, I would call it, uh, we do support electrothermal co-simulation, but we do not yet support the floor planner. So if you want to do floor planner and you want to combine your IC technology and your package technology, un unfortunately, you can't use nested technology or smart mount, but you can certainly still accomplish it. Okay. Uh, we have a question on licensing. Ernie asks, um, does ADS Thermal require a special license? Yes, yes. And um, we, we have different ways that we can bundle it together or, or, or sell it standalone, right? So, but it definitely does require a special license. And so um, if you're interested, definitely you should reach out to your, your local sales representative and make sure that they... Uh, they can give you, you know, an evaluation license. You can try it out, and um, and they can they can help you. All right. Uh, we have a question from Song. He asks, uh, "Do we have any examples for a limiter diode thermal simulation?" 
I believe, well, I, I know for, for certain we do have diode examples. Um, in, in fact, I placed an example on the Knowledge Center of an example of an electrothermal simulation with a diode. So I would encourage you to check that out and maybe reach out to us and we'll, we'll send you the link to that um, and uh, maybe put that in your feedback. All right. Uh, a question from Jerry. Uh, is it possible to run a PI Pro DC co-simulation with thermal simulation? Yes. Um, so you can run PI Pro. So that remember, that was not the topic of today, but I did have a slide on PI Pro thermal um, at the beginning, towards the beginning. And uh, that's a totally different type of thermal simulator. And there's no integration between this thermal simulator uh, you know, in PI Pro and the one I was talking about today, just to make that clear. But, um, but yes, in PI Pro, at the board level, you can run either pure thermal simulation or electrothermal. Now, the electrothermal looks different than what I showed today. It's, it's you know, targeted at different applications. But, but, yes, there is thermal and electrothermal in that tool. All right. We still have, uh, I think, a couple more minutes for a few more questions. We have a question from Oscar. Um, how do you go about changing the meshing? Yes. So we have those. There, there's only a small handful of um, meshing parameters that, that are uh, in the user interface. And uh, that's kind of done on purpose, actually. We, we, we didn't want to expose too many different settings that users have to tweak. Um, and, and that's kind of the purpose of that, that meshing algorithm parameter is it actually controls several different things all at once to make it easy for the user to uh, not get in trouble but also be efficient, you know. And, um, but for advanced users, there is an option to put in um, – we, we have a, um, a file that you can put into your uh, workspace that is a mesh configuration file, and it can actually – even, even further control the, the meshing. But that's a really advanced thing to do, and that, that wouldn't be my first line of, uh, you know, things that I would pursue with a customer. Um, you know, I, I would favor using all of the just the standard user interface stuff before I start trying to go in and, and use a mesh configuration file. Okay. Um, Andy has a question on, does a heat source take away power from a PA output power? And his note is so that the overall energy conversation, uh, conver uh, conservation is satisfied. Does a heat source take away? So we're calculating the total power dissipation uh, of a given device, and that power dissipation can be a combination of DC and RF. And so, and then we use that power dissipation to calculate the temperature. And um, and so we're getting the overall, uh, you know, dissipation um, from, from both of those sources. And so whether it takes away, I'm not sure how to answer that, but hopefully that kind of gives a little bit more clarity. And then for, for S parameters simulation, AC simulation, um, there's no time dependence, and it's, it's considered to be just purely DC in harmonic balance. We are getting the kind of RF effects of the power, and in transient and circuit envelope, we're also doing that. All right, we actually just have a, a couple more questions here. Uh, so Vikas had a couple more uh, comments. Uh, one is, um, is there a way you can do some kind of back of the envelope calculation to know what you simulated is correct? Can you easily calculate it so that you know your setup is correct? That's a really good question. It's harder than you think. <laughs> So um, I've seen a lot of customers come to me when they're first starting with this tool, and they are um, trying to do exactly that, to try to get some confidence in this tool. And what they'll do is they'll make some really bad assumptions, and it's actually, there's not a direct way to calculate it, but there are tools online that you can find if you look really hard that that make some approximations and some assumptions about how the heat from like a single rectangular heat source will spread through a rectangular chip downwards um, or upwards or whatever, right? Um, 
it's not a direct calculation that you can easily make, but there's there's um, math that can be performed that makes some assumptions, and they and, and you can start to calculate this, but it's not straightforward, even for a very simple problem of a rectangular heat source on a rectangular mm -hmm. substrate. Even then, it's not that easy. And then what makes it even worse is, you know, we've got temperature-dependent thermal conductivity, and so it just starts to be really hard to do back of the envelope calculations, which is kind of why you need this tool, you know, or a tool like this, right? All right, Jason, why don't we just do one last question. One more question from Dom. Uh, he asks, uh, does an ETH.RM file contain a thermal greens function? I don't think there's ex the exact equivalent of a greens function per se. So for those that don't know, the greens function is something from momentum, you know, electromagnetic simulations that we do. Um, I don't. I don't believe so. Um, I don't think there's an exact equivalent of that. But uh, you know, honestly, I, I, I'm not qualified to answer that. <laughs> All right, no problem. Um, thank you for attending uh, this uh, session on ADS electrothermal simulation. Please do visit us at keysight.com slash find slash events for a list of uh, all our upcoming webinars. Um, my name is Corey Mathis. Thank you so much for attending.